Okay, I actually had a lot of fun preparing this more than I usually do teaching. Apparently I have a lot of opinions about writing, so I hope it ends up useful for you. You can see the uh, PowerPoint, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. let's go on. Thank you. So the main thing that I wanna to convey to you is that um, the, the central goal of editing and restructuring the thesis should be to simplify, to remove extra words and to remove extra ink from figures and tables and anything that you can. And that through that process, you'll make it easier for the reader to see what the point is and what the content is and to like the, the, what they're reading, which actually makes a substantial difference to how they'll evaluate its quality. So even if you have the exact same information, but you've portrayed it in a way that's easier to read, things will, I am sure, go better for you. Because, um, you know, from, from my experience uh, working as the coordinator of the bachelor's thesis project, for example, um, the supervisors are often reading these late at night and they have a limited amount of time per thesis. And so if you bog them down in any extra information, that, uh, that is just makes it hard. I mention that so explicitly because often students write as if their goal is to include everything necessary. Make sure I didn't miss ticking any boxes. But you can't maximize that goal while not worrying about comprehension. Okay, so... I'm going to talk today a little about simplification, a little about thesis structure, and uh, some figures and tables, and then talk about the discussion. I want to give you some examples of writing that serves the writer more than it serves the reader. My first example is uh, formal or fancy language, um, and I consider this almost anything that you would only see in scientific writing. Now, that is with the exception of the results section that has lots of specialized language and terms in it. But in the introduction, there should be a real minimum of words that you wouldn't use to talk to your grandparents. You know, uh, it, that is to say, a lot of times I read these sentences and it sounds like they've been dressed up just so that they can sound more scientific. And actually the most persuasive scientific writing that is also easier to understand is often the simplest. Editorializing is anything where you describe to the reader what they should be taking away from what they're reading. Like, this is very interesting, or uh, this clearly shows that. Don't tell them how to interpret what they're reading. Just show them what you have, and then they can develop the interpretation. It's also tempting with editorializing to uh, comment on your scientific process, like, First, we thought we would code it like this, but then this happened. And then, and mostly we don't want to tell the reader about the process. We want just to explain the methods and the result. Frequent acronyms are also a, um, a tool that is much easier for you than your reader, even if you think it's quite common. In my field, for example, studying pro environmental behavior, PEB is used all over the place. But if you're reading, and a, and, a, and a paragraph has TPB for the theory of planned behavior and VBN for the value belief norms theory and PEB, suddenly it can get actually quite difficult to read. And it, it also, these shortcuts make it easier for you as a writer to ignore the sentence structure and not reduce things further. So I recommend against acronyms in most all cases. I minimize them in my work. A frequent thing that uh, a little bit larger structure that I recommend to students often when I'm reading their full introductions is to add some subheadings to guide both the writer um, uh, in knowing what you're saying when, but also the reader um, for what they can expect in a certain section. Because sometimes three or four paragraphs deep in a section, one is not really sure why one is reading what the words that are on the page. Yeah, so if you're building an argument, like uh, let's say you want to test a mediation, X modifies M modifies Y. It can be tempting when you begin to discuss X to say, we're interested in X because X, M, Y. And then when you introduce M to say, we're interested in M because it's caused by X and it causes Y. But if you repeat at every level of the argument, all of the effects, it gets very confusing. So I would suggest talk about one effect at a time. 
I mentioned that earlier. Okay, so writing that serves the reader is distinguished by these features. It is savagely edited to be shorter, and shorter is often clearer. It is always easy to understand, and one knows why one is reading the thing that is in the current paragraph. Key problems are explicit throughout. I mention this because all the students at your excellent level know that you must uh, talk about limitations in the discussion. But as, um, as something comes up, you know, for interpreting a certain result during the process, you, don't, you may not want to save it all the way for the limitation. You want to communicate to your reader what they need to know when they need to know it, which sometimes means talking about limitations a little bit earlier. This is a high level one. Importance is contextualizing through contextualized through other fields. The best, the very best theses, you know, they start broad, they go thin, they start, go broad again. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But then they also help the reader understand how important is this really? And just saying it's important does not cut it. One way you can think about that is by comparing the usefulness of the psychological perspective, given everything you know now. How does it compare to other kinds of perspectives? I mentioned here to, to demographics, which are big in political science, in demography and ethnography, and, uh, and price, which is big in economics. So just consider, like at the end of this, does psychology even seem like the right tool to address this? And if I read a thesis that said that psychology was not, that, that's interesting to me. That's unusual and fresh. You've all seen this uh, hourglass figure, right? Yes. Okay. So instead of walking you through the hourglass, let's just talk about these things on the right. Structural tips for the hourglass. Key terms, like how you describe a certain um, predictor, for example, that should match between your sections. I don't like to see, um, you know, self-efficacy in the intro and then later in the intro, ability to feel like uh, I can do it. And then in the operationalization, the participants see some other term in the items they're responding to or in the, in the method, it's labeled differently. Like we should be using consistent terms. Don't use synonyms for really key psychological processes because it makes it difficult to know what's going on. About causality, all of you know that we don't, uh, when we're using correlational methods, want to use causal language like A causes B. Okay, that's obvious. But it actually is a lot more subtle than that. So for example, um, let's say you draw a path model um, like uh, X causes M causes Y, and that, that's the mediation I just talked about a moment ago. But you only manipulate X, right? So then you test if X changes M and if X changes Y. You have not manipulated M, but you have this causal pathway in your model, M leads to Y. And often students will write about that like it's a fact. When you don't have data to argue yes or no of causality, and so alignment between how causal results are thought about between sections is, uh, goes well beyond just avoiding causal language when talking about your correlations. Operationalization shouldn't be a surprise. That is, when someone finishes reading your introduction, they should be able to, they should be able to guess in broad outline exactly what is being measured in the method before they read it. You can test that on someone. Give them your intro and see if they can guess what the method is or tell them to guess what they think it is and you can see where the intro has taken them. And measured variables should reappear. This is sort of classic in the last stages of a thesis to uh, you know, have crafted your story. But as the thesis evaluator, I'm often reading and thinking, okay, they also tested whether participants understood the information, but then it never appeared in the results section. And that is a problem. It doesn't mean you need to do all of the analyses in full depth, but you should at least mention that it is or is not going to reappear. It can't just be a, a loose thread. Okay. So a beginning structure of the, of the hourglass, you know, the abstract has um, a statement of what the problem is, some indication of why working on it is needed, then the current method, the findings, and then some sort of takeaway. And the takeaway... People often write something like, um, 
uh, limitations and current and future directions are discussed. I would recommend taking that out, never writing something like that because it is just editorializing. It doesn't tell the reader anything. Instead, use actual content. Like what is the main takeaway? What is the main limitation that was discussed? I'm not gonna read through this in great detail, but in the introduction where you talk about the, um, you talk about the problem or uh, phenomenon that is of interest, and then you go more and more narrow talking about previous work and why this research question is worth asking. The two main reasons uh, that you can use to justify why the current research is happening is theory testing. And that doesn't, uh, that can't just be, this is predicted from theory, therefore. Because why would you want to do it? Does it, does it constitute a test of that theory that we're trying to evaluate whether the theory is a good fit in this population using these methods at this time interval? I mean, everything, there's always differences between how you tested it and how those theories were developed. That, that can be valuable and you can say it's worth testing for these reasons in this place. Application is sort of an opposite argument, um, like the world needs to mitigate climate change, therefore we need to understand this pro-environmental behavior. That's more applied. It doesn't have to be like a psychological theoretical question. It, there can be both. You can have both theory testing and application justifications in the same work. But the most frequent justification by far is the student saying that there is a gap in the literature and therefore we need to address it. I like to say gaps in the literature aren't necessarily interesting. You have to say why filling that gap is valuable. For example, I could also say that I want to measure the length of people's noses and how, how often they engage in pro-environmental behaviors and then correlate the two. That has never been done. There's a gap in the literature around noses, but that doesn't mean that it's worth doing. So what's often, the, the answer is often there. You know why this is worth it, but we have to explicitly say why the gap is worth filling if you use a gap argument. I actually don't like putting the literature review at the end of the introduction. I personally recommend integrating it throughout the introduction. Like as you step from the more broad to the more and more specific, introduce previous literature that's relevant at each of those levels of abstraction. And then you'll arrive at where you need to be for your own justification of the current study and operationalization. That's, uh, that's my personal take. And that's how, and by the way, that's how research articles are structured. So your readers will be very familiar with that. Okay, this section of the talk, I wanna ask for some of your input actually. And this one is always think of the reader tables edition. Can I have uh, some, any comments on what you think about this table or what could be improved? Do you find it easy to read? I think it would be nicer if they placed it next to each other instead of under, um, like the data under each other. So like there's a mixing of rows and columns. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree with that. That makes it a little bit hard to find the mean, for example. If I want to know the mean of spirituality, I got to look up and down as well as left and right. Yep. Anything else? Let me walk you through what I see here and, uh, and then I'll give you another example. Rows and columns are mixed up. You just pointed that out. Uh, by which I mean, we shouldn't have one row for mean and then one row for standard deviation when the rows are already something else. The rows are the variable. Okay, next is don't mix where the units are specified. Um, here, for example, it says percentage, but percentage is very much like mean. So it should appear over here next to the actual units if that's where we're specifying where these are. Third is include the direction. 
political orientation. What does uh, 2.77 mean here? Is it liberal or is it uh, you know progressive or conservative? We don't know because they didn't tell us. Uh, be consistent. This is about spirituality. It says it's a composite, but religiosity also happens to be a composite in this sample, and it's not marked. Uh, I don't think you need to mark it, but there's a lack of consistency. The font is too small and the spacing is too large. That It just makes it harder to see uh, and readability. Keep in mind that your readers are generally older than you are with older eyes. And here you can see that they've included always two decimal places in all of the numbers, but that's not really what you should do. If you think a lot about this, you'll think uh, this is a level of precision that we don't actually have. Because if you remember back to significant digits, it doesn't matter which are the decimals. It matters what precision you have for your measurement. And you can think about how good that is based on what it is that you've measured, but three significant digits is often appropriate. So you can just say mean 38.3 and drop there. Finally, if you have a table that is uh, kind of too big, it'll break across two pages and that makes it way harder to read. So use page breaks right at the beginning of every table and figure, that would be my recommendation. Not just line breaks, but use a page break like command return, which will make sure it stays at the top of a new page. Here's an example of a table that I consider a little bit better. You can see that at the top of each column, we have the indication of what is being indicated in that column and they aren't mixed. So if you wanna know the mean of behavior, you just go behavior, mean, boom, and it's very easy to read. They're vertically aligned. It's a much denser table that also happens to include the range of the variables. So now we know uh, something about what is low versus high in each variable. Any questions on that? No, all of these tips, uh, yeah, some of them a little more specific, some a little bit more general, but all of them support a structure that will be easier to read. Here's an example of a correlations table I, I received in a thesis, and uh, do you have any suggestions for it? Do you find it easy to read this table? I mean, it's not, it's not that bad. Room for improvement. Teresa, what do you think? Uh, the first thing that I noticed visually is that variables is, um, well, not spelled out in one line. Mm -hmm. uh, that looks a bit weird. I agree. Um, then, I don't know, maybe the list uh, of uh, all the shortcuts is a bit uh, difficult to read, but I would- Very much, yeah. I what is W, for to, example? Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. know how to improve it though. Yeah, it can be hard when you have so many, um, but one way to improve that would be to number them and then write out a little bit more. And then in the columns, you can use the numbers rather than the full name, which will save you a lot of space. But yeah, I mean, you can't just use W. No one, no one, no one would know what that means. Any other suggestions? Is there anything that can be removed from this? You know, my great love is removing ink from the page. Let me take out the vertical lines. You can take out the vertical uh, lines. That's correct. That's not APA. Uh, and actually, you can take out many of the horizontal lines as well. You don't need them between every cell. What else? Could you take out the ones? You can take out the ones. Those are those are given. Yeah. And then that leaves an empty column at the end. You could remove that column. All of those things help you fit it on the page, help it be simpler. These, let's see here, uh, what else did I, ah, the other thing that I mentioned here in number five is just you can vertically align the decimals because the, the amount of characters in the cell differ, uh, it, it actually makes it harder to read 
because the decimal point bounces around based on whether it's negative or not. Here's an example of a table that is a little bit easily, easier visually. Everything's lined up vertically, so you can easily navigate to a certain result. It's denser. You have enough of the name so that you can sort of uh, navigate around. You can see that the lines have been only used to highlight differences between sections. So here at the top, you have some descriptives, okay? And then here at the bottom, these two are highlighted. It's not immediately clear why, but if you were to read the paper, it's because those are the DVs, those are the outcomes. And it's totally fine to highlight certain things that your readers should be navigating their eye to. What can they, how do you show them what's most important? Um, and let me see. Oh, they did drop the zeros in this. Okay, yeah. It, and drop leading zeros. You don't need zero point for a correlation because it can't exceed one. Same with significance. And, and less ink is uh, better, according to me. Okay. How about always think of the reader figures edition? What do you think about this figure? Anthony, do you, uh, you want to weigh in? Um, I would use less uh, bright colors and maybe colors that also differ a bit more from each other. I agree. Uh, it's weird to have extremely satisfied and moderately dissatisfied almost the same color. That's not helpful to the reader. Let's see. I wrote first increase font size, including the axes, the scale labels on the axis. That's just a little bit hard to read. Boost the font anywhere you can. That uh, and they usually need boosting. Also, female and male. This is pretty small for a reader. And then, uh, yeah, color consistency was mentioned, but also if you think about this at a, at another level, there's. There's all these colors, like uh, seven colors, and they're arranged left to right in both of the uh, gender areas. But then in the legend, they're not arranged left to right anymore. Now they're broken onto two lines. Every little change like that just makes it harder for your reader. I would also say these particular results probably don't need to be shown in a, in a bar graph like this. You could just use a mean and standard deviation. It's, it's just not that informative, this one. Okay, so we're done with the tables and figures, and let's chat a little bit about the uh, back end of the research project. The uh, method is probably method and results, the absolute narrowest part, and then you begin to broaden back out. And um, the first part of the discussion needs to still be pretty narrow. That is, you should uh, walk through the most important results, uh, but now with less statistics and more just words, and then broaden out uh, into the uh, uh, broaden out into the integration of those results with the previous literature, some of which uh, would have appeared already in the introduction. The discussion is not the place for new analyses. It's not the place for new conceptual developments uh, that like uh, a new model with a new figure or something like that. Um, but you can give new ideas there, speculations, connections, synthesis. Uh, it looks like I didn't quite finish what I was writing here in the corner, sorry. Um, most important threats to inference is what uh, this should say. So like uh, your whole study is trying to test some empirical idea. Now that you've seen the whole course of the study, how should the reader think about it? There have, you have your internal validity, like how well the measured concepts uh, tack on to the conceptual level. Like you were writing about self-efficacy, but then your operationalization was what, a self-reported scale. And you can think about that internal validity. And then the external validity, like the generalizability, it's trivial to say, we only tested this in this population, therefore future research can test it in a broader population. Much more interesting would say, we tested it in this population, therefore we think these results generalize to these specific populations. 
students at this university or students in all of the Netherlands? Or do you think students in Western Europe? Based on your sample, what do you think the results generalize to? And it isn't the goal to generalize as much as possible. The goal is to help your reader make the right conclusions. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I was just talking through that. Also, suggestions for future work is often overlooked in the discussion. Sometimes the limitation section reads like a list, like here's a problem, here's another problem, here's another problem. And that's very boring for the reader and they don't know which, one are, which ones are most important. So if you can focus in on a relatively smaller set of challenges and be really concise about how you describe them, you can save the words to convey to the reader what's most central and what are the you know, largest challenges for uh, interpreting the current work. When limitations are severe, like let's say you ran a manipulation and it didn't work, and then you got a null result for your condition, and you were planning to spend your results and discussion really exploring this major effect, but then there is no effect, please do speculate on the cause of why that happened. Um, but then you can pivot... Um, you can pivot to specifically how future research projects could address those challenges, not just should use a manipulation that worked. Um, so here's two examples. It's trivial to say that your sample size was small and that future research should use bigger samples, but better would be to say, what was the power or statistical power for testing our different hypotheses? So which of the key aims of the study were fine in the sample and which ones were not? And how would you address those challenges in future work that also has a limitation of how many people can be contacted? Trivial, future studies should pilot test the manipulation to make sure it works. Better would be, what would you do to the manipulation to make it stronger in a feasible follow-up study? If you were to run this study immediately again, what changes would you make? It's also typical, I mentioned this earlier, to put the limitations only in the limitation section. But if you're thinking about the thesis as a communication for the reader, then you should wonder, when does the reader need to know a certain key limitation? Probably when they're reading about that measure or those results specific to that measure. So consider integrating your limitations through the entire narrative. There's no... Um, you know, written rule that says that all limitations must appear in the list two thirds of the way through the discussion. To zoom out a little bit, the goal of the discussion is a smooth narrative that goes from that narrow summary into the broader concepts that were brought up at the beginning of the intro. And stepping um, Stepping gently through these levels is challenging. It requires you to write about the same sort of concepts first at the very operationalized level where you might use words like uh, relationship or measurement, and then at the more conceptual level where you might say um, uh, cause or you might say relation. I don't know. I mean, relationship could be a more sort of specifically correlational or it could be more general. And then broad is returning to that almost societal level of like, why would psychology even be the right tool for used for looking at this? So a trivialized, uh, trivialized, no, that's a different word. A more trivial or shallow discussion paraphrases the same arguments that are given in the introduction and just states them back in reverse order in slightly different language. But a very strong discussion will do new synthesis, integrating the findings with previous work, suggesting different angles, empirical or, or theoretical, for future work to take. So trivial, this issue is important. Future research is needed. I say trivial, I don't mean that very disparagingly. I just mean that's more shallow and many theses read like this. But better it would be Give a compelling explanation of what happened, what is possible from future research, and finally, what the stakes are, theoretical or applied, leaving your reader excited about the topic. So closing thoughts. 
The guiding principle when I'm writing is, is this, really, is this easy for the reader to understand? And principally, my tool for that is what can be removed? Can the sentence be shortened? Are there two subjects? Like um, frequently people write something like, um, one thing that uh, can be used to help reveal Y is X. But now we have said one thing that can be helped to use, you know, reveal Y is X. Now we've said one thing and X in the, to refer to the same concept. And so you don't need two subjects for the same noun. You can remove one. The goal is a persuasive and clear communication, not just a record of what happened, although the record is quite important. And to talk about this record issue, I want to briefly mention the main text versus appendix versus supplement. The main text, of course, you know, that's where you've been working. The appendix is something that in a thesis comes after the references most readers won't look closely at and shouldn't be too long. So, you know, an appendix could be one to 10 pages, maybe 15, but if you have 40 pages of code or something, the appendix is not the right place to put it. The supplement is any kind of thing that you might have online, let's say at a repository like the Open Science Framework um, that could include any number of things, like it could have other analyses, it could have uh, a code book to help explain what's in the data, it could have the data itself, your analysis code, it could have materials from the study, like an export of the Qualtrics. Those things belong separate from the work, but you can refer to them in your main text by linking or by saying with the appendix number. One thing that I see a lot in theses is um, additional graphs which are explaining assumption testing in key variables. That's great. We should totally be testing and discussing these assumptions, but we don't need these kinds of graphs in the main text in almost every case. So this, where would you put it? Would you put it in the appendix or the supplement? I think I'd go with the appendix. I think that's a good choice. Either would work, but appendix is probably what I would choose here. It might be important for the reader to uh, see the evidence of what you write in the main text about whether these assumptions were met or not, but they don't need to look at it right away. Finally, I have a couple websites uh, which are about different levels of the writing process. One which is about thesis quality overall, which will include some things about design and stuff that it's too late for now. But um, there's also stuff about sentence and paragraph level writing. I tried to focus today's workshop on the more high level structuring questions, but I have a lot of advice about sentences as well. And that is it. Thank you for coming and I will pause the recording and take any questions.